Welcome to the EPA Climate Change Conference 2021, Climate Solutions for a Better Tomorrow. We would like to draw your attention to some of the features of this platform. The main navigation is located to the left-hand side of your screen. Here you will find the program, live stream, speaker biographies, attendee profiles, exhibitors, Twitter feed, graphic recordings, how to contact us and frequently asked questions. The attendee engagement area of the platform is to the right of your screen. Here you can submit questions for our speakers, upvote or like questions that have already been submitted, participate in our polls, submit your event feedback and make notes on each session and then email them to yourself. The live stream can be enlarged to full screen. You can also click on show pop-out located on the bottom right hand side of the screen to continue to view the live screen while exploring the platform. The conference is about to begin. We hope you enjoy. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for day two of the EPA Climate Conference, Climate Solutions for a Better Tomorrow. Yesterday, we had three very interesting and engaging sessions where we heard from really excellent speakers. To set the scene for today, I'll take a few moments to recap on some of the key points from each of the sessions. Our first session of the day centered around achievement of climate neutrality. Ireland is not on track to meet its 2013-2030 EU targets for greenhouse gas reduction. And we heard that the achievement of 51% reduction by 2030 will require ambitious action across all sectors and society. The scale and pace of action required cannot be overstated and something that we heard frequently throughout yesterday's discussion. An overarching policy position was called for that is integrated and drives action across multiple strategies and programmes from climate change, air, water quality and biodiversity. It was identified how these are interconnected and indeed need to be tackled in an integrated way. We heard very much that it is an important time for climate policy in Ireland. The Climate Action Bill in a second stage debate this Friday and will be finalised by the end of the summer and indeed as a Climate Action Plan is also currently being drafted. This is happening in an international context with COP26 in November and EU Fit for 55 package to deliver ambitions this summer. We heard a very strong recommendation about framing climate policy around temperature warming impact and warming impact of activities and how Ireland has a real opportunity to be a global leader, particularly when it comes to the impact of biogenic methane reduction. We heard a very clear message early in this session that Ireland's climate transition is about people, communities, businesses and regions. And this came through again in session two and three. In session two, where we heard about the enabling the transition, national policy and carbon budgets, we got a clear message that consistency in approach is essential, and this can be achieved through the delivery of carbon budgeting. The Climate Action Bill will embed carbon budgeting into law, and the role of the Climate Change Advisory Council will be central to this. Our carbon budgets are being set on five year timescales, and they must ensure that they are real and achievable, while also considering and embedding climate justice. Ireland has a unique opportunity in Europe and possibly globally to harness its significant wind resource to help 70% of electricity renewably delivered, notwithstanding the challenges and social acceptance around the planning process. We heard again how policies will be fundamental to setting the transition objectives, the direction and supporting the journey but also how the importance of setting up and creating structures that will need to be in place to support and assist the transition of jobs from new job creation to upskilling and retraining. Our final session of today centered around agriculture and indeed the agriculture theme was common right through from our, our, our first session to the last. We heard about how agriculture will play a central role in meeting Ireland's climate objectives and much debate about the level of ambition. 
Achieving net zero agriculture greenhouse gas emissions requires a wider definition of agriculture that incorporates land use and land management strategies as well as bioenergy solutions. Land use changes need to be considered holistically in an ecosystem context, acknowledging the complexity, flux and connectivity of ecosystems. Our speakers also highlighted the importance of policy to ensure a fair price for farmers for food, as well as to, to put a value on biodiversity. We got a recommendation to incentivize farm processes that are climate smart and tailored to each farm. Overall, to sum up, we heard that the action will be challenging and socially complex, but business as usual is not an option. Building on those findings from yesterday, I see that we have a really exciting and again, hopefully a very engaging day here uh, on for, for the second part of our climate conference. Today, we're going to focus on the role of people in the transition to climate neutrality. These sessions today will focus on understanding the attitudes, behaviors, psychological and cultural preferences of different audiences in addressing climate change. The insights from this session will be drawn to understand how we design effective communication campaigns, engagement and activation. Like yesterday, we have an audience poll running. The question today will pose, that we will pose is, who do you think can, should take most action on climate change? Is it you, government, industry and business, or a combination of all of the above? Let us know. Our first session today will be chaired by Emer Cotter, Director of the Office of Evidence and Assessment here in the Environmental Protection Agency. And I hand over now to Emer to lead our discussion. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very, Mary Frances. Welcome to day two of the EPA's Climate Change Conference. And we have a great number of speakers lined up this afternoon to talk about people who are at the heart of the transition to climate neutrality. So this session is entitled Public Opinion in Developing Solutions to Climate Neutrality. And our keynote will be delivered by Dr. Anthony Leiserwitz from Yale University from the School of the Environment. And we're really delighted to have Anthony here. We have just started on a new project with Yale University. We in the EPA partnering with Yale University to get a better understanding of how Irish people's attitudes, beliefs, values influence their decision-making around climate change. So we're really excited about this project. We think it'll give us some really good insights. And um, Anthony will speak a little bit more about that during his presentation. Following from the keynote address, we'll have a panel made up of three great speakers, Professor Pete Lon, who's the head of the Behavioral Research Unit in the ESRI, Professor Anna Davies, who's the Professor of Geography, Environment and Society in Trinity College Dublin, and Caroline O'Doherty, the Environment Correspondent from the Irish Independent. So really looking forward to this session. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Anthony Leiserwitz. Great, and could I get a confirmation that you can see my screen? Great. All right, well, thank you so much, Emer, and thank you, uh, all of you, good afternoon. It's such a pleasure to be with you all today uh, and to be part of this really, I think, uh, groundbreaking conference. Um, so let me very quickly say I direct the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication at the School of the Environment at Yale University, where we study how do mass societies respond to the issues of climate change. Uh, and that's both here in the United States and around the world, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But today I'm going to talk about two big questions. First, what is the role of public opinion in responses to climate change? Why do we care about what the public thinks, feels, or does? And second, what does the Irish public think about climate change? And here I'll share a few early research results on the current state of public engagement in, in Ireland. From a 19th century energy system, where we're still digging stuff up out of the ground, like coal, oil, and gas, and setting it on fire to power our societies, we need to transition to a 21st century energy system where we harness the energy flowing around us at all times, from the sun, from the wind, from the tides, and from the heat beneath our feet. 
So especially for those of us in the relatively wealthy segments of the developed world, first, how do we use waste or conserve energy at home and on the road? So for example, let's just take, consider the countless transportation choices billions of human beings make every single day using cars, trains, buses, ships, airplanes, all of these transportation choices and systems are currently driven by the burning of fossil fuels. Yet in the next decade, hundreds of millions of consumers will need to choose to replace their petrol burning automobiles with electric vehicles or choose lifestyles that don't require an automobile at all. Will people choose and use more climate friendly transportation? Second major category, of course, is consumer behavior. Everything we buy from products like computers and cell phones and furniture and clothing and toothpaste to services like health and banking and insurance are still produced by value chains reliant on fossil fuels. Will billions of consumers prefer the products and services that are better for the climate or not? And will they hold those companies responsible for their action? Will they reward those companies that are leaders on climate action? And will they punish those companies that are standing in the way of progress? What kinds of homes and buildings will we choose to buy, retrofit, and live in? Will we live predominantly in single family homes, apartments, skyscrapers? We're building entirely new mega cities over the next several decades across the world. How will they be designed? Do we choose to live in urban, suburban, or rural locations? All of these decisions will have enormous consequences for the climate. What kinds of food will we grow and eat? The food and agriculture sector is a major source of global uh, carbon pollution. For example, will we continue to eat ever more beef, the production of which currently generates tremendous amounts of carbon pollution, or instead choose more plant-based diets or meat alternatives? It's also estimated that a third of all food-related emissions comes from food waste, food that's bought, taken home, cooked, but then not eaten and thrown out which often ends up in landfills where it decomposes and releases methane, a highly potent greenhouse gas. Our collective food choices and behaviors already have enormous impacts on the climate, as well as of course our health, our landscapes and other species. How will we power our lives? For example, it's increasingly clear that the world basically needs to electrify everything. Our vehicles, our homes, our buildings, including the ways that we heat and cool our homes, cook our food, wash our clothes and dishes, and heat water, just to name a few daily activities. This will require both critical but infrequent decisions, like how to replace a furnace once every 15 years. So how do we make sure that when people change out that old fossil fuel based furnace that they switch it to say something like a heat pump to everyday decisions in the kitchen? How can governments and companies and communities empower consumers to make these more sustainable choices? A third major area, of course, then, is our social behavior. First and foremost, the way we communicate about this issue. Do we talk about climate change with our friends and family members? Do we hear about it in the media and from our leaders? Talk is not a substitute for action, but it is a critical and necessary condition for action. If we don't talk about climate change, then for most people, the issue is out of sight and out of mind. And it certainly doesn't seem like it's an important issue, let alone an urgent one. But a second major factor is what we call social norms, these unwritten cultural rules that guide so much of daily life and decision making. And I'll just take one of thousands of relevant examples. One of my colleagues at Yale, Dr. Ken Gillingham, has shown that as soon as one household in a neighborhood puts solar panels on their roof, it increases the odds that somebody else in that neighborhood puts solar panels on their roof. And once two households put solar panels on their roof, that increases the odds that another uh, household will put solar panels on the roof. As, in other words, it's a form of social contagion. Because as Aristotle wrote thousands of years ago, human beings are social animals. We are exquisitely attuned to what other people say and do around us. Those social signals are hugely important in shaping all of the related decisions and behaviors that relate to climate change in our lives. And then on the deepest level, of course, this is about our cultural values and our deepest worldviews. Okay? Climate change is an existential threat. It is raising the deepest questions of humanity. Who are we? 
Where do we come from? Uh, what is our proper relationship to one another? What is our proper relationship to the more than human world of which we're part? And for those that believe, what is our proper role and responsibility and obligations to the divine, however you define that? Uh, we're seeing an explosion over the past 15 years of, for instance, the world's religions all coming to, to, to this challenge of the global climate crisis and saying, what does our faith tradition tell us about how we respond as human beings on this deepest, deepest cultural level to this crisis? And importantly, culture change often precedes political change. But let's not forget political behavior because that's my fourth major area I want to emphasize because it's crucial. Will the public support or oppose government policies to address climate change? Will they support a higher price on carbon or not? What policies are politically feasible? And of course, that's hugely influenced by voting behavior. Will the public prefer candidates that are climate champions and vote out of office those that are blocking progress? There's the role of public participation in community planning and decision making. What kind of communities do we want to live in? How can people participate in the design and implementation of these plans? And increasingly important, how can they be prepared to protect themselves from the ever more severe climate impacts that are already hitting home? And then last but absolutely not least is advocacy behavior. Will we not just support climate action but demand it from our leaders, what we call public and political will. And there are so many types of behaviors that people can and are engaging in from relatively simple things like signing petitions to donating money to organizations that are working on climate change to volunteering their own time with those organizations to themselves becoming active, active citizens, pressuring government officials and company leaders to be more ambitious, to take greater action. And for those that are willing to put their bodies on the line to engage in nonviolent civil disobedience. So all of these human decisions, all of these choices, all of these behaviors will collectively determine the fate of our planet. That's why we care what the public thinks. That's why we care what the public feels and what the public does about climate change. Public sentiment shapes the underlying social, cultural and political climate of climate change, which enormously enable or constrain climate action. So with that said, now let's just turn to what we're just beginning to learn about the Irish public. So as Emer mentioned, uh, my center at Yale University has partnered with the Irish EPA and Beliefs and Attitudes, or an Irish research firm, to conduct a nationally representative survey on climate change in the Irish mind. Uh, our hope is that this survey will help establish a baseline of public climate change beliefs, risk perceptions, policy support, and behavior. So among other things, we can track changes in, in Irish society over time. But in the meantime, the insights from the study can inform policymakers, can be used by the media, can guide public engagement campaigns, and ultimately provide a mirror to Irish society, okay? Uh, this is actually very difficult as a member of a society of millions of individuals to really know what do we as a collective nation or as a population, what do we actually think about these issues? You, you can kind of get a sense maybe from your own friends and family, but that often is not uh, an accurate reflection of your entire country. That's one of the great things about survey research is that it's a very uh, precise and distilled way to essentially hold up a mirror to ourselves and say, here's what we all think, here's what we feel, and here's what we're willing to do about climate change. Uh, the survey is currently in the field and we should have results in a couple months. But in the meantime, I do have a small appetizer that I'd like to just share with you today. So we just completed a short study conducted in partnership with Facebook Data for Good in 31 countries and territories worldwide, including in Ireland. So let's just start with the current state of climate change awareness in Ireland and around the world. So here I'm showing you uh, the results from this study in again, 31 different countries and territories across the world. Um, and the good news is that we find that 73% of Irish respondents say that they know a lot or a moderate amount about climate change. And Ireland is one of the leading countries in the world on this measure, okay? But note, that only 21% of the 
of Irish respondents say that they know a lot about climate change. And 77% in another question tell us that they want more information about the issue. So there is still a need and even a desire for more information about climate change. And they wanna hear that I'm sure from government, from business, from civil society. So we all still have a huge responsibility to engage this conversation uh, within Ireland. Does the Irish public understand that climate change is human caused? Well, here we see that Ireland is ranked very high. I mean, just according to this, you know, roughly third among all the countries that we studied. Um, and 58% understand that it's mostly human caused, which is great. But that still means that there's about 37% who think it's either caused equally or entirely by natural changes. And in fact, it's entirely caused by human activities. In fact, it's more than 100% because the climate science has demonstrated that if anything, the earth would be slightly cooling right now. And the fact that it's warming is that we've actually contributed more than 100% of the change. But then we come to the question of worry. How, much, how worried are you about climate change? And here we see that Ireland is not so worried about climate change. Only 30% of this, uh, these respondents are very worried about it. And many still see climate change as a threat relatively distant in time and space. But on the other hand, we see strong support for government action. 75% say that climate change should be a high or very high priority for the Irish government. So in other words, there's already strong public permission for government to take action. And moreover, we see that 73% of Ireland says that we should, that uh, Ireland should be using less fossil fuels than it does today. And a parallel question, we find overwhelming support for making the transition to clean renewable energy. But all that said, I wanna just leave you with one other, I think really important finding, which is about recognizing that there are different audiences. So I'm gonna come back to the United States to kind of explain what I mean here. But in the US, when we started doing these uh, studies over a decade ago, we very quickly realized that of course, Americans don't have a single viewpoint about climate change or frankly, any important issue. And then too often people would say, okay, there are climate believers and there are climate deniers. But that's far too simplistic and is actually not very helpful because in fact, it doesn't reflect the, the true difference in, in viewpoints that are out there. And in our work, we found six different audiences within the United States that each responded to this issue in a very different way. And one of the first cardinal rules of effective communication is know your audience. Who are they? Where are they coming from? What do they know? What do they think they know? What are their underlying values? Who do they trust? Where do they get their information? Only once you understand that can you then design your communication to meet them where they are, to engage them on their terms, not where you are, okay? I, I cannot emphasize this enough and we all fall prey to this, especially as experts. We're always at you know, the cutting edge of our knowledge or scientific knowledge and saying, let's talk about that. But for people who aren't there yet, that's not a useful conversation. So who are these different audiences? So let me just introduce them quickly using the United States as an example, because we found these six different audiences within the United States. So this data is from our most recent nationally representative survey in December. Um, the first is a group we call the alarmed. These are people who are firmly convinced it's happening, it's human caused, it's uh, urgent, and they strongly support action. Okay, this, these are the people who are the most engaged with the issue. Then comes a group we call the concerned, these are people who also think it's happening, human caused and serious, but they still think of it as distant in time and space. The impacts won't be felt for a generation or more, or this is about polar bears or developing countries, but not the United States, not my state, not my community, not my friends, not my family, not me. And as a result, it's psychologically distant. It becomes one of a hundred other issues that are out there and maybe I kind of support action, but I don't really understand why this is urgent. Then comes a group we call the cautious. They're still on the fence. Is it real? Is it not? Is it human? Is it natural? Is it serious or kind of overblown? They're paying attention, but haven't yet made up their mind. Then a group we call the disengaged. And these are basically people who say, I don't know anything about it. I think I may have heard that term once, but I don't know what causes it. I don't know what the consequences are. I don't know what the solutions are. Then a group we call the doubtful. And these are people who say, I don't think it's real, but if it is, it's natural. It's just natural cycles. Nothing humans have anything to do with, nothing we can do anything about. 
And then last but not least is a group we call the dismissive. And these are people who are firmly convinced that it's not happening, it's not human cause, it's not a serious problem, and many quite literally tell us that they're conspiracy theorists, that it's a hoax, it's scientists making up data, it's a UN plot to take away American sovereignty, and other such kind of conspiracy narratives. Importantly, they are only 8%, but they're a really loud 8%. They're an 8% that has tended to dominate public discourse in the United States, and they are still uh, very effectively blocking action that we're waiting to see what's going to happen over the next few months in the United States. So with that introduction, let me just quickly also say, just to emphasize the fact that there are totally different conversations happening in the United States around these different audiences right now. So we've asked this question, if you could ask an expert on global warming one question, what question would you ask? And what we find is that the doubtful and dismissives on the right of your screen say, how do you know that global warming is happening or human caused? And on a deeper level, they're really asking, why should I trust you? Whereas the middle groups are saying, okay, so it's real, but so what? Why should I care? What does this issue have to do with anything that I care about? Whereas the groups on the, on the left here, the alarmed and concerned say, okay, I got it. It's happening, it's human caused, it's serious, but what do we do? And this is a real problem, I think, globally, is that we've done actually a better job communicating to these folks about this reality and the seriousness of the problem than what we can do about it. And that's really key in their minds. What can I do as an individual? What can we do as communities, as cities, as counties, as nations, and as the world to actually address this problem? So even here, you can see that there are very different audiences and they have very different needs and they're starting in very different starting points. So what do we now know? Uh, so we've taken this approach and we tried to apply it to uh, the global situation. Uh, it's not perfect. I will say that one of the big goals of our uh, forthcoming study in Ireland is to actually do a tailored version of this for Ireland because Ireland is not the United States, thankfully. Um, but we are able to use this tool to kind of do cross comparison uh, uh, analysis. And so here's what we see around the world. So what we find is that 70% of the Irish public is alarmed or concerned. So alarmed are about 34%, concerned were about 36% in this study. Uh, and the alarmed want to know what can they do? But the concerned still need to understand why climate action is urgent. And 15% of the Irish public we estimate is cautious and not yet sure whether climate change is real or not. And the remaining 15% know even less or are dubious that human caused climate change is happening. So the point is that each of these audience need tailored communication and engagement strategies. But the good news then, again, is that you've already got about 70% of the population that are either in the alarmed or concerned uh, camps, which means that you already have a fair amount of at least public permission to act, if not yet full-throated government or public demand for action. So to conclude, mitigating and adapting to climate change is gonna require not just smart policy or economics or innovative financing or technological innovation, but it's also gonna require different decisions and behaviors by seven and a half to nine billion human beings. It's incumbent upon all of us to engage and empower our families, our friends, our colleagues, and our fellow citizens to build public consumer and political will for climate action. Thank you again for the invitation uh, to join you today and I look forward to our conversation. Okay, thank you very much, Tony. That was absolutely fantastic. And really we are looking forward to getting further in, in terms of the, the results of, of the survey that we're working on with you so that we understand how Irish people I took away think, feel, and find out what they can do about climate change. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the panel discussion now, and I'm going to introduce, first of all, Professor Pete Lunn, who's from the ESRI, um, known to many of you, I'm sure, um, has been very um, visible in the last number year, really, in terms of COVID, and, and that in particular um, is what we're interested to hear from Pete, is are there some learnings from the behavioral side that um, he has on the COVID um, response and transferring that into how we respond to, to climate change. So over to you, Pete. 
Um, thank you very much, Ema, and thank you, Tony, for a really good presentation. Um, I, I don't disagree uh, with all the same. I can't think really of anything that Tony said there that I, I disagree with. Um, so it may then surprise you to learn that this afternoon in my five minutes, um, I'm probably going to be the awkward squad. Um, and let me tell you why. Um, and let me see if I can start something of debate here, because I think it's debate that needs to be had. Um, my feeling is we're not even at first base in understanding human behavior and how behavioral science needs to be used to tackle the climate change problem. I don't think we're even at first base. And let me explain why, and I'm going to explain why by what I've heard during this conference, which is why I say I'm going to be the awkward squad. There is a model um, of climate change policy and how it relates to behavior. Um, and I think Anthony's research fits into that pretty well um, and you know, makes a really good contribution to it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and contextualize that to tell you how far away I think we are from a solution and how much more needs to be done from a behavior and behavioral science point of view. And I want to put it in that context in the five minutes I have available. The model that I hear all the time in conferences like this, and to be honest, many others I've attended at this stage, is that climate change gets its solution by a lot of international politicking that produces obligations on countries that result in centrally decided targets. These are usually set sector by sector. They then result in solutions being sought to meet those targets sector by sector, and everyone in every sector talking about how challenging this is going to be. Um, they use challenge, they then use the following expressions, they talk about getting buy-in, they talk about the need for education, I heard someone talk about farmer education yesterday, they talk about awareness raising, they talk about changing attitudes, they talk about communication campaigns, and even this afternoon we've heard people talking about how to frame the problem, which was something we heard more about yesterday. In other words, the model is, we decide centrally what needs to be done, we look for solutions that are challenging sector by sector, and then we persuade, 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 and we use market research techniques to see whether the public's at to help us to do that persuasion, because we realize the huge extent of behavior change that is involved in these sector by sector solutions that we are after. Now, that I think is a model of how we are approaching this from a policy point of view. As a behavioral scientist, I can tell you that in my view, looking at all the evidence I see, that model is utterly insufficient. It's necessary, it's insufficient, and it's so insufficient, we really have to change the way we think about this problem. The reason it's insufficient is the following. There is an enormous amount of behavioral science that will tell you that the link between attitudes and behavior is really weak. There is enormous amount of behavioral science that will tell you that the link between people's intentions and their behavior is weak, let alone their attitudes. There is also work on what's called the knowledge transfer model that shows the weakness of trying to persuade and change people's behavior by imparting scientific knowledge in the hope that them understanding that will then lead them to change their behavior. There is also a huge literature, particularly in the environmental space, that shows the weakness of environmental, inter sorry, of educational interventions in trying to get more pro-environmental behavior. In other words, persuasion, knowledge transfer, education, awareness raising, trying to change attitudes, all of these things have at best really weak effects on behavior change. And as Anthony's pointed out, we need massive behavioral change to ta tackle the climate problem, right? So it takes so, so much more. Why? Because a lot of human behavior is unconscious, a lot of it is habitual, a lot of it is influenced by norms, as Anthony said, a lot of it is simply based on day-to-day -day convenience because people aren't thinking about the problem that you are thinking about as a policymaker. Why? Because they've got to feed their families, get the kids to school, go about their daily lives, and do you know what? Enjoy themselves as well. It's really hard, and behavior change is incredibly hard. Furthermore, Human beings have an inbuilt bias against change. If you want to look up the relevant behavioral effects, you might look up what's been studied about default effects, about status quo bias, about emission commission bias, about endowment effects, about ambiguity aversion. These are all the buzzwords in behavioral science that will tell you that human beings have a really strong inbuilt desire to resist change, except when they really have to change. So there's a huge problem here, all right? Now, I'm not coming here as a prophet of doom. What I'm telling you is that the behavioral levers we are currently trying to use are insufficient. They are too based on surveys and marketing and looking at attitudes and education and knowledge transfer. They are not based on a genuine and really strong understanding of behavior change. Furthermore, the most important thing from my point of view as a behavioral economist is that what they're not doing is linking behavioral science to the huge economic levers that we are going to have to use to tackle climate change. What I mean by that, what I mean is 
to really tackle climate change is going to require much stronger regulation. It's going to require more bans, and it's going to require a huge shift towards the polluter pays principle, whereby we introduce taxes and subsidies that radically alter the price mechanism so that behaving in a manner that damages the climate becomes prohibitively expensive. Burning fossil fuels has to become massively more expensive. Now, why is behavioral science involved in that? That sounds like orthodox economics. Well, it is, because there are orthodox economic solutions. But the reason behavioral science matters so much is underpinning all of those solutions are that our ethics, our perceptions of fairness, right? And if you want people to engage with those systems and accept them, and you want sectors to go along and to change and go with those reforms, you're going to have to do a huge amount of behavioral science to understand the ethics. Miles Allen raised the issue yesterday, actually. We talked about the different ethics between polluter pays when it's applied to an industry that starts up and pollutes and when it's applied to a farmer that's been farming for five generations in the same space. The ethics are massively different and the public will understand that. The public have an in, in, intense, and we know this from COVID, understanding of a collective action problem. How when we are all in this together, you have to see a clear way why be, if we all behave in a certain way, we can achieve the desired outcome. That's the behavioral science. That I think really needs to be done here to get people on board to understand the collective action problem of climate change and the solutions that are required in order to engage with it, which require that principle of polluter pays, requires a principle of saying when is a behavior utterly unacceptable and we ban it? When do we regulate to prevent people using pollute, uh, polluting in the way that they might pollute? And there's a huge amount of behavioral science that needs to go in there to get the kind of change that we need. So, so much more than we're doing at the moment. So I hope at the end of all of that, you think what I've said is constructive because it's intended to be, but it is based on the critique of the model we have at the moment, which is simply insufficient to get the kind of change we're trying to get. Thanks very much, Pete. It is all heating up here, that's for sure. At the awkward Scott, <laughs> self-named. Um, I think we're gonna have a good discussion. Please start putting in your, your questions. I see them flowing in and um, you can direct your questions by using the at symbol to particular speakers. You can vote on the questions to move them up um, the, the, the list and, and also keep them short and concise so that I'll be able to get through as much as possible um, during the Q&A session. So I'll hand over now to Professor Anna Davies from Trinity College Dublin. Thanks, Ema. Uh, and thank you, Anthony, for giving us your insights. I, I totally agree with you. That what's important here is much bigger than merely snapshots of public opinion, but is actually about why people think, feel and do what they do. And all those processes, emotions and actions are related and how they're related or not to the wider context. The issues are, as, as Anthony said, much bigger. Um, and, and we really need to uh, reduce, we can't reduce debates about addressing climate change to individual acts of consumption that will be alone insufficient to meet the challenges we face. So I'm totally on board with what Pete was saying there. Uh, we are, despite the COVID constraints, and as Pete mentioned too, ultimately social beings who live in particular places, have a range of relations with others, perhaps in terms of communities of place, where you live, but also in terms of interests, that's the activities that you undertake. The places that people inhabit have uneven and differentiated configurations of natural resources, materials, regulations and infrastructures, which have developed from particular cultural and political histories. And the legacies of these histories remain visible and influential in our landscapes today, and they also affect our actions. So what we do and think is shaped by a combination of what I would call rules, tools, skills and understandings. And these rules can be social and regulatory, subject to change, albeit often at a slow pace. There are, for example, in Ireland, many social rules about what's appropriate to eat, when and how, which are shaped as much by media and increasingly social media as they are by, by science and missive structures of health and safety regulations. The material tools we have available to us are also important, whether that's having access to smartphones in order to buy things online or to spade to turn the earth in order to grow your own vegetables. Even more than this, it's the existence and accessibility of the underlying infrastructures which support the tools that we might use. If you're an office worker and don't have access to broadband, it's unlikely you'll be able to work from home, for example. And if there are no electrical vehicle charging points around you, then running uh, an e-vehicle is unlikely to be a sensible option. But even considering these rules, tools and infrastructures is not enough. Individuals also need to have the necessary skills and understandings to engage with the rules, operate the tools and navigate the infrastructures. 
shouldn't be forgotten that the capacity to act is unevenly distributed amongst people and communities. Uh, in research and grassroots initiatives in Ireland, I conducted a distribution analysis and found that few were located in the most deprived areas. It's not surprising because if you're struggling simply to keep a home over your head, there are few spare resources to build alliances with others. What's needed for a just transition to a low carbon future for Ireland is a long term framework of support to build capacities, an ecosystem of community focused organisations that work collaboratively with each other, the state and commercial actors. Basically, context really matters when thinking about responding to climate change and consideration of all these influences simultaneously is required when developing strategies for climate action. There will be no one size fits all response, as Anthony mentioned, and policy interventions alone will not be up to the job. But neither will burdening individuals with all the responsibility to demand change from those in positions of power. Much more needs to be done to build the skills, that's what you can do, and understandings, that is why you need to undertake particular actions around climate change, and specifically in relation to climate change adaptation planning. Difficult debates will need to be had regarding increased risks to homes, livelihoods and critical infrastructures from the effects of climate change, particularly in coastal communities and floodplains. Well, we're trying to do this in current research funded by Science Foundation Ireland as part of the Enable Spoke on Smart and Sustainable Cities. In the Climate Smart project with Stefan Hugel, we've built an online platform of resources, including a serious game, to introduce young people to the science of climate change adaptation and the complex decision-making processes that policymakers work within in democracies such as Ireland. So education around dealing with interventions in complex adaptive systems needs to start early and needs to provide opportunities for students to bring together insights from multiple disciplines, from STEM, subjects including geography, to political science, sociology and history. We need to develop a new generation of Leonardos who are comfortable understanding flood risk predictions as they are planning processes. So in conclusion, the public are certainly part of the solution to our climate challenges, but powerful actors in the currently unsustainable system must also play their proportionate role, particularly in supporting the development of infrastructures that enable all people to take carbon act, low carbon actions. So just as the global scale within Ireland, we have common yet differentiated responsibilities and I look forward to discussing these things with the panel and Anthony, thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, that picking up many of the themes that we heard from both Tony and Pete. Moving on then to the final um, speaker in this panel discussion before we move over to the Q&A is Caroline O'Doherty from the Irish Independent. So handing over to you now, Caroline. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about communicating climate change through the media. Um, for my part, that's the Irish Independent and independent.ie, but I think my experience is probably shared with a lot of those in other mainstream media. And it's this, the climate crisis is undoubtedly the biggest story in the world. So you would think it would be the easiest story to tell and it isn't, and here's why. So climate crisis has all the characteristics of that sort of exclamation mark story. It's traumatic and shocking, it's tragic and it's infuriating. And yet what am I doing? Well, typically I'm writing about the cryptic issue of emissions trajectories. Um, policy formation, which can be very staid, and sometimes the pantomime elements of the political debates around the issue. Those stories do not convey the enormity of the subject. And they don't get the level of engagement, unfortunately, from readers that we'd like to see on topics that are so interesting, or so important. See, I don't have the benefit, and I say benefit in inverted commas, of a glacier, you know, crashing into the sea off Hoth Head or Galway Bay every day to bring to my news conference and say, look what's happening, look here, climate change, you know, on our coast. Thankfully, not yet. But even where there are more sort of immediate climate stories to tell, I can see it's tricky there too. I'm looking at what's happening in the United States at the moment, uh, particularly in the West Coast, uh, extreme heat wave, unbelievable temperatures. And there's a debate going on there and, and criticism of media for their failure to reference climate change in their reporting. Now I'm looking at what they are reporting and they're reporting the forecasts and the alerts and the health warnings. And they're looking at the impact on public services and infrastructure, and they're giving information about local cooling centres, where to get help, telling the human stories of hardship and heroics and doing a good job. I don't think there's a deliberate attempt to sideline climate in their reporting. I think it's simply a case of they have an article or broadcast they're working on right now that has a particular job to do right now. Get this aspect of the story out, get this information that's needed at this particular time. That's the nature of focused reporting, when audiences have limited 
kind of attention spans and, and other demands on their attention, which is the case everywhere. So could the US media do better? Yes, I think they could. And I hope the criticisms are given and received uh, in, in a constructive way. Now, could media here do better, uh, given that we have comparatively limited experience of climate change, uh, really, and relatively few you know, critical weather events that would illustrate it for us? Yes, we could do, and we're, we're going to. But it is a real challenge to find ways to deliver the information to readers so that they will actually take heed, they'll grasp the details, and most importantly, they'll come back looking for more. Now, it was like that before COVID, and COVID has not helped. <laughs> So we have a lot of experts making the links rightly between COVID and the climate and biodiversity crises. And they're looking at how the response to the pandemic, you know, could be a blueprint and, and shape the way for a united response to climate. But I'm just not sure the public are thinking that way yet. You know, COVID has caused so much grief and stress and hardship. People have had just to have enough on their plates. So while the experts and politicians are talking about a green recovery and building back better, I think a lot of the public are just thinking, let me out of here, I want a sun holiday. That is understandable, but you can see how hard it is then to say to people, you know, maybe put the holiday in hold and put that money towards saving for the heat pump that Anthony mentioned, you know, because we have this, you know, other crisis we need to talk about. But then realistically, even when we're past COVID, there'll always be some other crisis that feels more immediate. So housing, rents, health service, the economy. And I know, I, and I acknowledge to, uh, Anthony's opinion polls there, but a recent opinion poll asked people, what issues would affect their vote in the next general election that was just in the last couple of weeks and climate change was at the bottom you know well not at the bottom it was right above the um the don't knows just above it. so anything that helps with understanding what way people are thinking and how they might be better engaged in this is really useful and i i think the work done by anthony and pete and anna is really useful i'm going to be cheeky and say to anthony that you know if you come to ireland there'll be a seventh category and it'll be there ask me again tomorrow because i do think people change and their interest ebbs and flows, depending again on what personal crises is it's before them and what distractions they have. Now, I said out a tale of woe and all the difficulties we have in making this great big story having a great big impact. So I'm going to look at some of the advantages we have. We do have a public in Ireland who are great consumers of news. You know, they're still interested in news. So we do have an audience to work with and we have to be you know, excited about that. We have a young population who are climate literate. Now, they may not be consuming much news generally, and we know they're not paying for news, but and most of them will have got their climate information from non-media sources. So we have to remember that. But soon enough, hopefully, they'll come to us looking for news on those other issues that start to impact their life when they get that tiny bit older. So rents and housing, health care and ch child care and all the grown-up fun stuff. And they'll expect to see good climate reporting there too. And that's good because that'll be demand-led and we'll have to meet that demand. We also have sectoral interests who have a lot of skin in the game, so whether it's farmers worried about the changes to come or the engineering sector excited about the changes to come, we know where they're coming from, we know what their interests are, so that gives us a way to talk to them. And critically, and I think this shows up in Tony's, um, Anthony, sorry, Anthony's um, studies, we don't have climate deniers in any, significant, in any significant numbers. Now, we do have a lot of sceptics in terms of the targets that have been set and the measures we're setting out there and the whole response that we're going to take to climate action. But that's okay. If we can take their questions that they have and find answers for them through good reporting and through good input from the experts, and that means help from a lot of you out there. And if we can distill it down in a way that actually provides the answers, you know, then I think we can engage our readers. We can hold them and we can make climate change part of their normal, what they read and what they expect to read and what they understand and what they look for more of in their media, whether it's broadcast or print. And then I won't have to wait for the great chunk of ice to come floating in onto the Irish Sea, you know, to get their attention. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Caroline. That was really, really insightful into the challenges that you face on a daily basis um, in getting this, um, getting people's attention. Okay, we have really lots and lots of questions coming in, so um, which is, is fantastic. So I'm going to move around the panel, take these questions um, as, I, as I see them, the, mo the more popular ones are coming up. Um, and we'll start to... Um, Anthony, we have a question here from Paula Leonard. Thanks for the, the great presentation. Your survey has been running in the US for a number of years and you've observed changes in attitudes and behaviours to climate change. How has and is this information being used by decision makers in the US? So maybe just how, how, it's, how it's actually used and, and lands with them. 
Great. So first of all, I want to say thank you to the um, to my uh, my fellow uh, respondents, uh, Pete and Anna and Caroline, for your very thoughtful comments. And you know, this is part of the danger of trying to capture an entire field in ten minutes. Uh, it's very difficult to do. And in fact, I agree with everything that was said there. Uh, Pete, you know, our research has been actually focused. Uh, so I would push back a little bit and just say surveys are a tool of research, but what you use that tool to understand can be far deeper than most political polls that you see uh, reported on the news. So you can study the deeper psychological, cultural, and political factors that shape public opinion. And I would just like to say very importantly, I, I, mean, I totally agree that we need to reframe this. We need to do much deeper thinking about the nature of human beings, our psychology, what prevents us from engaging with these issues. And yes, we do need to increase, for instance, the ethics of this. But then comes the critical question of how do you do that? How do you build the public and political will for those changes to support politically those high prices on carbon that you're calling for? That's not an easy thing at all. And so I'm just saying that I think social science can do a really a lot of work to try to figure out what are the pathways by which we can build that kind of public uh, engagement and ultimately demand for those actions. Um, I also just want to quickly emphasize that, Anna, your point about the, di the, the unequal distribution of impacts and resources to take action is so vital and we cannot lose track of that both within our countries and across the world. Uh, those of us who are relatively wealthy in the developed world bear so much more responsibility for leading on this without, rec without forgetting the fact that the rest of the world is trying to develop their own economic uh, wealth and, and uh, power as quickly as they can too. And we need to help them not follow and do the same things that we did by, for instance, emitting so much carbon pollution in the process. And then Caroline, uh, so important about how the media reports this issue. I would just say, if you want to see how we try to implement these, like, these deeper findings and insights into this, uh, I would encourage people to come take a look at Yale Climate Connections. It's our own climate news service that we've run for over a decade, where we're trying to connect the dots. And that's really the key point I want to say here. This is about connecting the dots between this abstraction, which to most people is climate change. It's about science. As you said, many of your stories are very technocratic. How do we connect the dots between this seemingly abstract problem and the things that we actually care about, okay? And they can be things that you wouldn't care about maybe as a policy person, but people care a lot about coffee or they care a lot about chocolate or they care a lot about their local community. How can you connect the dots for them so you, you don't have to get them to suddenly become a scientist that understands tipping points and you know, parts per million in CO2 in the atmosphere? That's a big lift. Again, meet them where they are. Help them understand why this issue is so important to them based on what they care about. That's really the underlying point I wanna make. Now, very quickly, I'll just say, so we've been doing this for over a decade. We've had tremendous, uh, I think, uh, experience now informing government officials. So we've done everything from working with the White House to members of Congress, to state legislatures. Uh, we have elected officials who are using our results to basically decide whether to run, what issues to run on. Uh, we've had a number of members of Congress that have seen our data and said, I'm gonna run on climate change as a climate champion and use that to win successfully. We've got companies that are using this kind of data to inform their markets. like. Where are we going to expand our products and services? How do, we, how do we help our consumers understand that our product is going to be better for the climate than somebody else's product? Uh, and then we work with hundreds and hundreds of uh, civil society organizations across uh, the United States who are busy trying to build that public and political will for action. Um, leaving aside even then all the journalists that use this data because they can, it's a great way, it's a great news hook to talk about uh, uh, their own readers and their own uh, populations. So I just say that this kind of research on the deep level that Pete's talking about is absolutely essential, um, but it's also so incredibly useful, practically speaking, for so many key stakeholders within society. Okay, thanks very much for that. Tony, um, Pete, you, you've struck a chord without a doubt when I look down through the questions um, and I'll take one here that has 21 likes um, from Sive O'Neill. Sive is saying, 
music to her ears, what you said, we are putting too much emphasis on individual behavior when individuals have such limited power to bring about the major changes needed and not enough attention on regulating pollution and polluting behavior at design stage, upstage, but explaining that is difficult. And Anna, you would have addressed these points as well. What is your opinion in the best way to frame the need for system change? What are the key questions that should be asked in service to capture this point? I'll go to Pete on that. Um, okay, there's a huge amount in that question. I wanna make one very quick thing clear with Tony though. I, I, I'm not against survey research, I do survey research. <laughs> I'm just suggesting it's hugely limited in this context. And that does relate to the question that's just been asked. I mean. I actually think pushing climate change onto individual behavior is a classic deflection tactic of industries that do not wish to be regulated, and they do it all the time. There's a huge record of it in multiple areas, and climate change is the latest of it, and it's really pernicious, and we have to fight back against it. The crucial thing is how individual behavior and the, system and the systematic changes interact. I mean, we have to build systems that help people to behave in ways that are less damaging to the climate, and we have to build systems that do exactly the same thing for companies. But companies are people. Companies are just collections of people. And one of the problems, if you want to move to a system that is a polluter pay system whereby we genuine or a system that includes genuine penalties for people who are causing climate change, you can write down the model that says what that world looks like. And that's really easy to do, right? which is why you, you read all sorts of comments from orthodox economists saying climate change is such a, an economics 101 problem to solve. Right? The behavioral part of this is how do you get from A to B? It's how do you get from where we are now to that model that we can write down? whereby people are actually paying for the pollution that they cause. And that's what's incredibly difficult. And there, I think you need really focused behavioral science that is sector by sector, which is looking at the ethics of how you get from A to B. Who bears the cost? Who gets compensated? How much compensation do they get? What's people's perceptions of what's fair? Why? What historical legacies are buried in that? How much action are we expecting of them now? And how accurately can we measure how much it's going to cost? Because that impacts on the fairness too. Because if you burden some people with greater uncertainty than others, it's more problematic. Now, what I'm trying to get across is that's where you've got to use behavioral science to try to solve those problems of how you get from A to B to make sectors conform to principles which embed within them good behavior and systems whereby individuals and the system are at one in producing better behavior. And that has to happen in multiple sectors and multiple walks of life. That's why it's an incredibly difficult challenge and why I say we're not at first base, because I don't think we've understood that in principle yet, let alone started to do it in the places where we need to do it. So that's really where I'm coming from. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Pete, for that. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to read and listen. This is, um, this is great discussion. Um, Anna, there's a question here for the panel, but um, I wonder, would you, would you have a go at addressing it um, from Cormac McGarrett, who is saying Amsterdam has gotten huge boat shift to non-motor motor car transport. Um, what, why did citizens change? It's not because they are greener, better, nobler than us. They said, because it's easier, the government made it easier. How can we make it easier? Not easy to reach climate solutions. Yeah, it's a good question. But I think, you know, again, it's that matter of context. And, and Amsterdam has a long history of engaging in, in low carbon mobility um, infrastructures. So yes, it is easy. And it was relatively easy, I guess, in that context to, to expand those infrastructures to support even more use of cycling and, and active transport modes. I, I think, you know, in a, say in an Irish context, particularly in a Dublin context, we're pretty much hamstrung by, you know, centuries of urban design, architecture, planning, which don't provide space to accommodate these kinds of active travel modes in addition to what we already have. And I think this is, this is a classic problem that I've experienced in many different situations, whereby you have a system and then you layer on top of this different sort of modes and infrastructures without really addressing the core fundamental underpinning issues. Um, uh, you know, we need to go back to the drawing board, um, but making those changes in such physical terms is incredibly difficult in terms of both the time it takes to do it. I mean, we still don't have um, uh, an underground in, in the Irish system to get out to the airport or, or anything else. Is that ever going to happen? I've been in Ireland 20 years this year and, and this is still being talked about. Um, we know that that has a long lead time. You know, it's really going to be a problem to do that because of the physical changes. So we have to be incredibly careful moving forward and planning is going to be incredibly important in protecting what we have in terms of green spaces and open infrastructure, uh, but also ensuring that we don't sort of 
lock ourselves in to even more uh, carbon focused um, practices, really. So it's incredibly difficult. But I think also you have to consider the political systems in, in the Netherlands and Amsterdam, which has been historically incredibly participatory, much more participatory than it would have been in an Irish context. So the systems of trust, and this came up, I think, in what, what Pete was saying, but also maybe in some of Anthony's comments. You know, we need trust in systems, we need transparency, we need accountability, uh, and we need to have these regular kind of monitoring um, debates and to, to see where we are. Uh, and we need data to do that. And we need regular updates and we need to be held accountable to the results of those changes when we're not moving in, in the right direction. Thanks, Anna. The, the context, cultural data, um, it is, it, um, you've, you've covered a lot of ground there in your answer. So Caroline, I have a question here from Mechtel Schuller, I'm sorry if I've got that wrong, um, but um, the question is, there is a tendency in certain media to only print things that are controversial. So they've used the example here of Save Lim Leitrim campaigning outside forest gates. Um, but when those involved in this example in forestry try to highlight the positive aspects um, of a forestry in terms of climate mitigation, this does not get reported in the media. So how do we get positive messages out there? Okay, well, I was speaking for the independent, we have a weekly supplement on farming and I know that this issue has been exhaustively reported because forestry is considered part of the, the agricultural landscape. So I think every possible angle, and there has been a, a, a lot of proponents, we've columnists plus reporting. So I'm gonna say we've done okay on that, but I do know that, Generally speaking, yeah, when it's when it's become to you know rouse, there are two sides to that story, um, the, and the Save Leitrim one is is a very it's a very emotive story for anyone who's driven across Leitrim and you see what the landscape has become. Um, um, so I'm, I'm not gonna I'm, I'm gonna actually you know throw that back a little bit and say you know there, there are there are plenty of getting their stories across. I think it's getting a little confused because. Um, you, the industry side of it, the, the, the commercial forestry side of it has been working away fine. Um, they've hit a roadblock because of the licenses and the licenses hit a roadblock because people started looking at them and saying they needed more environmental scrutiny. So it's, it's not the case that, you know, suddenly one side is getting all the publicity. One side highlighted a problem, highlighted an issue. So that's what's getting discussed. Other groups for whom that, you know, feeds into what they've been trying to say all along, have jumped onto that. Also, you know, when the issues can be quite dull, you forestry per hectare, you know, we've tried to be excited about it and said how many trees were planned to plant and, and how many of them are going to be deciduous and how many of them are going to be native and all that kind of crack. And it's a hard thing. Once you've said it once, it, it's kind of hard to then generate any more interest in it. So when it does become a row in the doll or at a protest, it is going to get pro it is going to get coverage, and I can see where people feel well. That's only that part gets attention. It gets attention because it's news right now. Um, but it, bear in mind why it has become news. A system was in place for a very long time that suited commercial forestry. Somebody challenged it, and the row is kind of the news. Um, so it's not the case that I don't. They're not going to get positive publicity, but their, their point of view it will be reflected. Um, and, it, and it has been, it's been well thrashed out in, in it all, but look at, we'll bear it in mind, but do turn to the farming independent because it's, it, it, it has been a, a running issue for a long time now. And certainly because it's the farming media, there's a lot of voices from the forestry sector getting their say there. So. Okay, thanks for that, Caroline. Anthony, we'll come back around to you and then feel free, I'll give you a question here. Feel free to pick up anything we've heard as well in, in the recent um, the recent discussions. But we have a question here from Taigo Mahoney, um, who's looking at things from a different angle. So apart from sectoral policies, what role do you see messaging via junior schools, junior environmental studies classes in messaging um, successfully on climate change related issues and driving behavioral change in family audiences? So, so looking at the ed educational side of things, um, um, if you could take that question, Anthony. Sure. So let me touch on a few different topics that I think are really important. So first, I want to come back to what Pete started because it got me thinking. He says, we're not even a first base. And then I realized he's probably using that in a cricket context, whereas as an American, I'm thinking of American baseball. I think we have actually reached first base because we have four bases. 
Uh, and I think we are at least that far in the, in the behavioral uh, understanding of these things. We're not starting from, from zero. Um, the other though is a really critical conversation that I think we need, to, we need to expand our thinking about. And that is this recurrent dichotomy and debate between, is it about individual change or is it about systems change? As, as, as if this is an either or choice. And yes, absolutely, Pete's right. There are certain uh, industries, BP and most very famously has been outed as having had a strategy, a communication strategy to basically try to say, this is consumer's fault, right? You're the end users, you need to recycle, you need to re reduce your energy use, you're really the source of the problem. Of course, they were doing that for their own selfish reasons. That's true, but that doesn't negate the fact that this is a highly complex system of systems and that this is not an either or. We need both. We need individual change and we need system change and they're interwoven with each other. As everyone has talked about, the systems we create shape the choices that are available to us. I would love as a, as a, you know, a climate concerned citizen to have my own private bullet train uh, from New York to Los Angeles. I can't do that. Elon Musk can't do that. That's only the kind of decision that uh, my country can give to me, right? And that's only gonna happen if I and many other uh, Americans can band together and build the public, public and political will to demand that solution. That's my ultimate point here is, as Pete was saying, economists, policy wants love to come up with all these wonderful futures for us. And you know, this is what we need to do. And they're right in many cases, but then how do you get there? Because we keep running up against the shoals of political will. I wish I had a penny for every time I've heard that referenced at every level of government, we just don't have the political will to do what we know is needed. That's what I'm saying is that the public does play an important role, not the only role, but an important role in shaping and compelling public will uh, and political will. And then to that last question, let me just quickly emphasize, here's an example of an organization in the United States that I think did something really innovative. And that's a group called the Alliance for Climate Education. They said, it's not just about going in the classrooms with better curricula and that's all important, okay? Let's, it, it, basic education, basic climate literacy absolutely is important uh, in the long run. But what they came up with was an idea and this maybe is an American context, but there's long been a set of uh, public campaigns targeting parents saying, parents have the talk with your kids about sex and drugs. Okay, it's, it's, it, was a met, it was a campaign targeted at people like me to say, have, sit down with your kid, have the talk about sex and drugs and the dangers therein, okay? What uh, the Alliance for Climate Education did is they took that same basic idea, but they inverted it. And they said, kids, you need to have the talk with your parents about climate change. And they taught kids how to do this, thousands of them across schools across the United States how you actually start that conversation. Mom, dad, can we talk about climate change? Okay, how do you begin that conversation? And what we have seen in our research, getting back to these deeper in social dynamics, for example, that uh, we've looked at the influence of kids on their parents and parents on their kids. And as the parent of an 18 year old, I'm happy to report that yes, we do find that parents do influence their kids, uh, especially around things like energy use behavior. Um, but also importantly, we see that if anything, the arrow of influence runs stronger the other way when it comes to climate change, that empowering kids to go to their parents and say, I care about this. This is what I'm learning. Uh, I need you to understand this because this is my future. Okay? That's an incredibly powerful, deeply personal social relationship. Some of the most intimate social relationships we have in life is between our parents and our kids. And that's the kind of conversations that we need to uh, encourage and support. Thanks for that, Tony. And and uh, <laughs> nodding away between the baseball and cricket references, like I, I could participate in that. But Pete, um, if you want to take up that theme, but I have a, a question here from Keita Mahoney, which is saying, during the COVID crisis, governments and media have been mostly good at getting the scientific message out about what to do what to do to keep ourselves safe. Can this approach be harnessed to support climate change and climate action and the importance of trusting the science? It seems lobby groups dilute the messages, the measures in the media in particular or play down what's required. Uh, 
I did that thing. Um, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, on the schools thing, in all honesty, our green school system is absolutely terrific at getting across climate change information to our kids, as I know from how much my two have badgered me about the issue for months on end. Um, now, you know, we haven't published this yet, but actually, if you look at the choices that people make as teenagers, as consumers, and the environmental friendliness of those choices, you can just about see a marginal effect to whether people were in the green school scheme or not. And what does this tell you? It tells you what every other evaluation of educational interventions tells you, which is at best, they have marginal effects. It's not just true in environmental ones, it's true of financial education as well, and multiple other areas. Yes, they're important. Yes, they make a difference, but they are not, and they're no panacea. And the difference they make is usually much smaller than the people who advocate for them in the first place expect and that's just the science of it um on the covid question yeah i i think the real opportunities here um the public has understood covid as a collective action problem from word go and they have voluntarily made sacrifices for the public good now that is in the face of an immediate threat right and an immediate personal threat so it's very different but they have made sacrifices for the public good on a voluntary basis and what we know from the science we've done during this period is that they have done that better when they could see that there was a coherent strategy whereby if we all did something and we all did it together, we would all get a collectively better outcome. And at that point, they were really willing to change their behavior and do it. Now, I actually think, unfortunately, that was a much, much easier thing to explain, even though we had lots of difficulties doing it. And as you rightly say, lots of lobbyists got involved and muddied waters for their own interests and all the rest of it. I actually think it was much easier to do with COVID than it is with climate change. But we do have longer to do it with climate change. We have longer to build that narrative. I think the intergenerational element that Anthony's just brought up is really, really interesting. I mean, one of the reasons for the Greta Thunberg effect is it puts narrative and intergenerational narrative into the ethics of climate change decisions and climate policy. And as soon as you do that, it's amazing how much leverage that has, far more than educating people about the causes of climate change, I would argue. Right. So there are real lessons in that, too. And that's what I mean by how we need to use the behavioral science. It really has to be more creative. Um, in looking at all of the potential levers that are available to us about how we interface with these systems and about building principles of fairness around which we can all agree that if we instill these principles within our society for who is bearing the costs, because ultimately that's what it comes down to. We can solve climate change if we pay enough to solve it, but the cost is massive. So we have to decide who is going to bear it and sort out the ethics and the fairness of that and how to get from A to B. And that's going to take years to get that collective consensus on how to do it. And that's why I'm sort of saying we're not at first base. We don't have bases in cricket, unfortunately. You do only have them in baseball, and that is what I meant. But, I mean, if you'll even accept we're only at first and we've got to get all the way around to fourth, then we're pretty much on the same page. Oh, dear. And that's okay. what I'm getting. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much, Pete. Okay. Um, I want to just give um, put a question to Anna and Caroline and then finish up. So, so Anna, there's a question here from David Dodd. Um, given the increasing following that influencers have on the younger demographic, does the panel see a role in trusted influencers being used to support the messages from more traditional experts on challenges like climate change? So I thought, Anna, from a social science perspective, you might um, have some thoughts on this. Thanks. So I also have some insights as a parent of teenagers around TikTok and things like that. And I've had conversations actually around that given that uh, organisations like the Rediscovery Centre in, in Ballymun, which is the National Centre of Excellence for Circular Economy, have recently set up a, a TikTok account and are engaging in Instagram and all these other platforms. I mean, there are certainly spaces that young people spend a lot of time on. So I think engaging with them is essential. Um, the role of influencers is incredibly powerful in some instances about what, I don't know, face cream you use or how you wash your face or whatever it may be whether they are the right people to address the kind of fundamental structural system problems that we have I think that they should be included certainly in the strategy around communication around engagement um, but I wouldn't place a lot of hope on them to lead the charge in this regard particularly um, because as you see through, through these influencers, they are also being heavily courted by powerful interests to promote certain products and practices. So, you know, it's not a holy grail for sure, um, but it is certainly a space where lots of people are hanging out and will be receiving information. So we have to engage with those platforms also and the influencers within them, but certainly they're not going to solve all our, all our problems. 
It's about, I think, you know, reflecting on, you know, these kind of levers for transitional change. And Donella Meadows from the Limits to Growth back in the 70s talks about this. And we, we spend a lot of time tweaking around system, bits of the, the system changes around taxes and things like that. We need to really address the fundamentals around worldviews uh, and approaches. Thanks, Anna. Um, and it's certainly, yeah, using, looking at everything, um, maybe there's a place for everything, but just not one, there's not one, one particular answer, as you, you said yourself in your talk. Um, Caroline, then, the final question um, to you, which is um, <laughs> maybe a loaded question, but uh, do you think, it's from Paula Leonard, do you think the media are doing enough to shape um, public opinion towards understanding the, the transition required to reach our targets? She said, thanks for your excellent um, contribution earlier. Well, thank you. The first thing we have to do is find out how the transition is going to happen. You know, and there's been a lot of build-up of talk about our targets and so much discussion about the targets and the climate bill is all about the targets and setting the structures. You know, we're going to all learn about carbon budgets. But what is missing from this piece is the transition. What does a, you know, a 51% reduction in emissions actually mean? Now, that's all going to come out, I was going to say soon, Realistically, you know, if we have the climate bill enacted by autumn and carbon budgets on the way. It's not really going to be until next year, and probably next year's regular budget, never mind the carbon budget, where we're going to have to start to see what, what polluter pays mechanisms are put in, you know, and what incentives and initiatives are put in, what measures. So I, mean, I would be delighted. I'd, I'd say no, the media is not doing enough because we don't have the information yet. We're waiting for it to come from on high and we really need it to. And, and they know they know they need to get it to us as well because if that's where the doubts come in. It leaves space. It leaves space for arguments over nothing. It leaves space for arguments over what we think might happen or what we think will be the impact on us. Um, and that's not good. What, we, what needs to happen in a big rush now with a lot of measures and a lot of steps, as I say, with the climate bill, with the legislation, with the carbon budget, with the measures that are going to be pinned down, There'll be a lot of information, hard information to give to the public. And that's going to be really where we have to up our game and get that out there. Not only just get the information, but explain the implications at people's levels, in their street, in their shop, in their school, in their in their household, what that's going to mean. Because at the moment, very often, you know, we've had the budget, we've had what the carbon tax. And, you know, so we can certainly explain what that means to your, your, your the petrol in your car. Um, there's not a lot else we can give people in many ways you know, how this is actually going to impact me. So when we know, the public will know, media will make sure you know. So yeah, we're not doing enough, but we need the materials. We can't make it up either. No, that, that's for sure. And thanks thanks very much. And I want to draw the, the, the Q&A session to an end and say, first of all, thank you to all of the, the speakers on this panel. It was really a fantastic discussion, um, really engaging, um, provocative, thought-provoking thought um, and wide-ranging. So I, I really enjoyed it um, and, uh, and I really um, want to say thank you to the, to, the, to the speakers and also then for the great quest questions that have come in from the audience and um, have have managed to stimulate that conversation even further. So before I finish, um, I just want to um, ask our, our audience to have a look around the platform and um, to have a look at the resources that are available on that platform. Don't forget the poll. Um, please do give us your, um, your opinions on our question, which is who do you think should take most action on climate change? So you might have um, um, learned a little bit more during the last session to help on that answer. Um, but look around the various material on the platform and do um, come back at 3.30 um, for the next session and enjoy your break in the meantime. Thank you very much.